Welcome back, I'm Dr. Dai, and in this video, we're gonna talk about passive membrane transport. Um, plasma membranes are selectively permeable. That means that they allow some substances through, but not others, selectively. Um, passive transport is a naturally occurring phenomenon which allows substances to move from areas of higher concentration, so where there's lots of something, towards areas where there's a lower concentration of it. Uh, in a process that we call diffusion. Um, so this is the most direct form of membrane transport. Simple, doesn't require any energy, only required thing is a concentration gradient. So a difference in concentrations between two solutions. In our case, what we mean is a difference in the concentration on the outside of the cell compared to the inside of the cell. And that gradient, that change difference, um, is going to drive molecules to diffuse from one side of the membrane to the other. Um, a molecule is said to move down its concentration gradient as it moves from the area of high concentration to the area of low concentration. Um, so the plasma membrane, they are, we call it asymmetric. So this means that the interior of the membrane is not identical to the exterior of the membrane. You already know this, right? We've talked about the polar membrane heads as opposed to the nonpolar uh, fatty acid tails, right? Um, so we sometimes, this means we're gonna have to have some sort of special protein to create a channel or a pump to move things through that membrane. Not everything can pass through there on its own. Uh, if you have a very polar molecule, it's not going to be willing to move through that nonpolar tail region, interior of the plasma membrane. So we're gonna to have to put something in there. Um, so the, uh, what we call like fat soluble substances, um, such as um, oxygen, carbon dioxide, they don't have a problem. They, they can pass through. Um, so they can be present in the aqueous solution and they can diffuse through the membrane. They're very, very small and they're, um, non-polar enough um, to pass through. But if you have something very polar, like a water molecule, it's, it's not going to readily diffuse through the membrane. We have special um, aquaporins, special water channels, pores in the membrane that are specifically there to allow water to flow in and out. Um, some ions, even though they're small, um, can't easily pass through the membrane if they're charged, so if they're too polar. Um, things such as sodium, potassium, calcium, chloride, they all require special channels or pumps to move them across the membrane because they're too charged to interact with the nonpolar tails. All right, so diffusion. Um, the movement of a substance from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration until the concentrations are equal. So they come to equilibrium. Um, diffusion is passive. It does not require energy. The energy for it to happen is stored in that concentration gradient. So diffusion through a permeable membrane um, allows the concentration gradient of a substance, or follows the concentration gradient of a substance, excuse me. Um, so it's gonna move from high concentration towards low. So if we look at our little picture here, so we can see we've got, you know, over time, that's what we're looking at. This is looking at diffusion over time in a closed um, setting. So we have this high concentration of, uh, let's say it's uh, carbon dioxide, just something that will pass through. So we have this high concentration here and there's none on the other side of the membrane. Over time, those molecules will diffuse across the membrane because they're small and a little bit nonpolar so they can pass through and they will start to accumulate on the cytoplasm side of the membrane. Over time, enough will pass through that it reaches equilibrium. Now they don't stop, this is dynamic. There's always gonna be molecules going back out and back in, it's just it's dynamic, but it'll stay in equilibrium, it'll stay in that even space uh, until something impacts it. Several factors can affect the rate of diffusion. The first is the concentration gradient itself. The greater the difference in concentration, the more rapid the diffusion will occur. Um, the mass of the molecules diffusing, that's going to matter as well. Um, really massive molecules are going to diffuse more slowly. Um, and in some cases, very slowly because they're too big to just pass through the membrane itself, they're going to have to go find a channel uh, that they can fit through to go through. 
Uh, temperature impacts diffusion as well. Higher temperatures um, feed more energy into the system. The molecules move around more rapidly uh, and can diffuse across the membrane more rapidly as the membrane loosens a little bit in higher temperatures. And then solvent density. So that would be what your uh, whatever you're talking about, the solution that it's in, the solvent. Um, so your solute was the molecule, right? And your solvent is the, what it's dissolved in. So in this quick case, it's you know, the, the cytosol or the extracellular um, fluids. So the more dense that is, the um, slower the rate of diffusion is going to be because the molecules can't move through it as easily if it's very dense. So like that extracellular matrix space is quite, is quite dense. It's quite thick. Uh, viscous, and so things can't um, pass through it as easily. As I've already mentioned, sometimes just diffusing across the membrane isn't possible depending on the molecule. Maybe it's too charged, maybe it's too big. So in that case, we have to have something called facilitated transport. This is still passive transport. It doesn't require any energy to be fed into it in order to, for it to happen, um, but it requires channel some way to assist the molecule across the membrane. Um, we can, so we can call it facilitated transport or also facilitated diffusion. Um, and it's going to follow the same rules. We're going to be moving down the concentration gradient. So from the high concentration area to the low concentration area, no energy is going to be spent. Now we can talk about osmosis. This is very important, right? This is diffusion of water through the semipermeable membrane. Like I already mentioned, water molecules can't just simply diffuse through the membrane. They rely on special pores in the plasma membrane to transport across. Um, so for osmosis, this is right, the movement of water from an area of high concentration to an area of low water concentration. But water is the solvent. So water is what does the dissolving. The dissolved substance is called the solute. So you can have a lot of different solutes dissolved in the solvent. Um, you know, things like carbon dioxide and oxygen and calcium and other proteins and lipids and all sorts of stuff. Well, not so much lipids, they don't like the water, but still. Um, so if a solute cannot cross the membrane, the solvent water will. Okay, this gets a little bit tricky. So what I mean is, if the solvent is, for whatever reason, too big, it doesn't have a pore it can cross through, what will happen is the water will shift to bring things to an equal concentration. So that's how much of the solvent is dissolved per volume of water. So if we look at this um, example in the picture here, you can see that on the left, we have we have equal amounts of water on both sides of this. The red dot, red line, dotted line is a, a semi-permeable membrane, much like um, the plasma membrane would be. So we have equal amounts of water on either side of this semi-permeable membrane, but we do not have equal concentrations of solute. There's much less on the left-hand side than the right-hand side. So Ideally, right, the solute, the little dissolved molecules on the right-hand side would diffuse across the membrane until they came to equilibrium, but they're too big. They can't cross that semi-permeable membrane. So what will happen is the water from the left-hand side is going to shift to the right-hand side until the amount, the concentration, the amount of solute per volume of water is the same. So the water level, the volume goes down on the left-hand side so that the concentration of solute matches. And this is really cool. You can do this experiment with these really cool U-shaped flasks. And it does. The water, instead of staying equal on both, at both levels, it'll roop. It's really neat. All right. So we can use this then to refer to cells and the osmolarity in cells, with the word tonicity. tonicity. Um, so this describes the amount of solute in a solution. So osmolarity is the total amount of solutes dissolved in a specific amount of solution. So we can have a hypertonic solution where there is a much more solute outside of the cell and it drives water out of the cell to try to even the concentration. Um, we can have isotonic, where the amount of solute on either side of the membrane is equal, 
That makes the cell happy. Cells like isotonic solutions, particularly animal cells. And then we can have hypotonic, where the concentration of solute inside the cell is a little higher than outside the cell, and that drives water into the cell. Plant cells actually like to be just a little bit hypotonic. It helps with that turgor pressure, okay, so that they hold their shape. Um, okay, so let's talk about those in a little more detail, right? So hypotonic, that was the one we just talked about. Cell, plant cells like to be just a little hypotonic. So the extracellular fluid, again, has that lower concentration of solute. It drives fluid into the cell, it drives water into the cell. Um, in animal cells in particular, this can cause the cell to burst, to lice. Um, you may have seen like on the news, uh, like those water, uh, water drinking challenges and stuff. Those are actually really dangerous uh, because they can cause your cells to go hypotonic like too much water can cause um, water toxicity causes all sorts of problems um, actually makes the person very disoriented um, they can seem as though they're intoxicated um, and it, it can cause cell lysines bursting um, hypertonic like we already mentioned that's where the extracellular fluid has a much higher concentration of uh, solute than the inside of the cell and it drives water out of the cell uh, we see this um, in plants, you know, like cut flowers, we see this uh, where the, as the cells are kind of losing, you know, they're not bringing in new food anymore because the plant has been cut. It's, it's not really, it's not really still living, it's kind of in suspended animation, if you will. Um, over time, that water is going to start to flow out and the cells will shrivel. And um, in plants, you know, it'll start to, to wilt and stuff. Um, in animal cells, it'll cause them to shrivel as well or crenate. And that's also also very dangerous. It can happen when you're um, dehydrated. And then isotonic, that's where, for animal cells in particular, right, we're nice and happy. The extracellular and intracellular environments have relatively uh, equal concentrations of the solute. So water moves in and out freely and maintains equilibrium. Okay, so like I already mentioned, some plant cells are... Right, some cells have cell walls like fungi and um, plant cells, uh, some bacteria, some protists, and they, they like to be a little hypotonic. Um, the plasma membrane can only expand so much within the limits of the cell wall, so it won't lyse. The cell wall keeps them from lysing, but it keeps that pressure, helps them keep that rigidity. Um, like we said, in hypertonic solution, they'll, they'll lose that and they, they wilt. Um, so turgor pressure depends on tonicity. tonicity. All right. Okay, so we made it through passive transport. Thank you for joining me for this discussion. Um, when you review this material, make sure that you get comfortable talking about how tonicity works um, and how the role passive transport plays in tonicity. Um, this is one of those that it's really good to like, draw it out um, so you have a clear picture because what thing, which things concentration you're talking about differs if you're talking about tonicity as opposed to other types of passive transport. All right, I will see you in our next video.